There's been a lot of buzz lately about the long-anticipated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, with a few companies announcing remarkable success in their Phase 3 clinical trials amid reported efficacies of greater than 95%. These particular vaccines also represent a novel and innovative departure from the standard methodologies used to develop vaccines in the past, and I want to spend a few minutes discussing these details. When our bodies are exposed to a pathogen, our immune systems, predominantly through various members of the white blood cell or leukocyte line, defend us against that invasion by recognizing the virus or bacterium as foreign and mounting a coordinated attack against the same. The major players in this process are the B cells, T cells, and the mononuclear phagocytic cell line, which include monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. For our discussion, we will be focusing on the dendritic cells, also known as antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. Looking back at our coronavirus, there are four major structural proteins on the surface of the virus that can serve as potential identifiable antigens for our immune systems, including the spike, or S protein, nucleocapsid, or N protein, membrane, or M protein, and envelope, or E protein, all designed to house and protect the delicate genetic material in its hollow spherical core. The dendritic cells phagocytize and digest or break up the virus or bacterium. Once disassembled, these cells can then present some of the characteristic protein structures or antigens of the invader on their cell surface. The dendritic or APC cell then travels to the lymph nodes where it presents its findings to other members of the white blood cell line. The T cells learn the various antigens and use them as targets to identify infected host cells in the body. They then alert the immune system to the invasion, recruiting other members of the leukocyte line to assist in the battle and hopefully destroy or disable the virus before it can gain access to a host cell. The T cells can then destroy the already infected host cells, preventing them from replicating new viral particles. The B cells analyze the various viral antigens and develop antibodies that are specifically designed to attach to the freely circulating viral particles. One B cell line may produce antibodies to the spike protein, another to the envelope, and others to the nucleocapsid and membrane protein. Once trained, each of these B cells turns into plasma cells or memory B cells. Plasma cells are basically antibody factories pumping out the newly developed viral antibodies that can then attach to the specific protein antigens of the new viral particles, either deactivating them directly or providing a target for destruction by other members of the immune system. Each B cell or plasma cell produces a single species of antibody designed to attach to its specific protein antigen that was initially used to train the cell. Specifically, the spike protein plasma cell produces antibodies which attach only to the spike protein of the virus. The nucleocapsid plasma cell produces antibodies which only attach to the nucleocapsid protein of the virus, the envelope plasma cell to the envelope protein of the virus, and the membrane plasma cell antibodies which are specific for the membrane protein of the virus. With a new or novel pathogen, this leukocyte training process takes time during which the virus or bacterium continues to multiply and infect other cells of the body, sickening or killing the host in the process. This is where the memory B cells come into play. Hanging out in the lymphoid organs of the body like the lymph nodes and spleen, the B cells can be quickly mobilized into antibody-producing plasma cells if a new infection from the same virus or bacterium is encountered in the future. Specifically, if the immune system encounters the identical antigen in the future, the memory B cells rapidly divide, convert to plasma cells, and begin flooding the host with antibodies to quickly fight the infection. In other words, the host has now developed an immunity to this particular virus, reducing the clinical impact of subsequent infections. The primary objective of any vaccination is to train the body's immune system to recognize an infecting particle and develop antibodies to the same before an actual infection. There are a number of methodologies used to develop and deliver a vaccine, some of which have been in practice for decades, while others are relatively new and unique to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. These include killed viral or protein-based vaccines, live attenuated or inactivated viral vaccines, and genetic-type vaccines including viral vector and lipid nanoparticle vaccines. 
We're going to take a look at each of these. Killed or protein vaccines use the destroyed or disassembled viral particles, which are then harvested and injected into the host. The protein components of the virus stimulate the immune response, developing antibodies and memory to the same, just like an infection with the actual virus without the disease-causing component. As the name implies, live attenuated vaccines utilize an intact viral particle that is either naturally or artificially manipulated to be less virulent in the human host, but still possesses the characteristic surface proteins to train the immune system. Smallpox was a deadly and disfiguring virus, killing 30% of infected patients and permanently scarring many survivors. In 1796, British physician Edward Jenner noticed that milkmaids who previously developed the less serious cowpox wouldn't catch smallpox. The cowpox virus has similar surface proteins to smallpox for immunity training, but is much less virulent in the human host. Utilizing his observations in the milkmaids, Dr. Jenner performed the first vaccination on the 12-year-old son of his gardener in 1798. Instead of using a naturally occurring relative of the disease-causing virus, we can actually create one in the lab. After the viral pathogen is isolated and harvested, it can be cultured outside the human body. This has been classically done in chicken eggs, where the virus is injected into a chick embryo. After an incubation period, the virus is collected and then injected into a new embryo, where the process is serially repeated. Eventually, the original virus becomes more adapted to the cells of the chick embryo and loses its ability to infect and reproduce in the human host cell. Either way, the attenuated live virus is then injected into the host, stimulating the immune response and memory, but minimizing clinical symptoms. These types of vaccines usually afford a more sustained immunity over multiple years. To understand the genetic type SARS-CoV-2 vaccines currently completing their clinical trials, we have to review the physiologic interactions of the viral particle and our host cells. This is covered in depth in the video SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 on this same YouTube channel, but we'll give a brief two-minute summary here. Each of our cells contains a central nucleus, which holds all our genetic material that makes us who we are. The nucleus sits in the cell cytoplasm, along with other cell organelles like lysosomes and ribosomes, all of which are contained by the outer cell membrane. Now our precious DNA, the blueprint of our entire existence, never leaves the protection of the nucleus, but somehow needs to get its encoded information to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm for protein production. This is done through RNA polymerase. For clarity, we'll simplify our model getting rid of the cell membrane and cytoplasm, showing you only the encapsulated nucleus and surrounding organelles. The polymerase reads the genetic code and produces messenger RNA or mRNA. This genetic template can leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. The ribosome, with a large and small subunit, then reads the messenger RNA, assembling a series of amino acids into a specific order, which then fold into a complex 3D geometry, producing all the necessary structural and enzymatic proteins that keep us alive. The SARS-CoV-2 virus gains access to the host cell and enters the cytoplasm, possibly through a process of endocytosis. Lysosomes fuse with the endosome, injecting proteases into the organelle, which break down the surface proteins of the virus and endosome, releasing the viral genetic code into the cell cytoplasm. Coronavirus genetic material is a positive sense RNA genome of about 30,000 bases, quite large considering some viruses contain a few dozen bases. Positive sense means that the viral RNA structurally resembles messenger RNA or mRNA of our host cells and therefore can be read and translated directly by the host ribosome. Scientists have figured out the segment of the viral genome that encodes for the spike protein of the coronavirus and are using this subgenomic genetic sequence as the core of their vaccination products. Since this sequence resembles messenger RNA, it is known as a messenger RNA or positive sense RNA vaccine. However, to do its job, the RNA sequence needs to remain intact while it is transported and incorporated into the host cell cytoplasm. 
Historically, this was accomplished with a viral vector. The virus is loaded with the genetic code, and the virus was then used to infect the host cell with the new genetic sequence. However, the current vaccines use a structure called a lipid nanoparticle for transport and delivery. Similar in structure to the lipid transport vehicles of the body, including chylomicrons, low-density lipoproteins, or LDL, and high-density lipoproteins, or HDL, they consist of a phospholipid shell which engulfs and transports the genetic code through the bloodstream. It's common knowledge that oil and water don't mix. To transport fatty molecules through our bloodstream, the outer wall of all lipid transport vehicles contain the charged phosphate group of the phospholipids and the charged portion of the free cholesterol molecules, allowing the entire sphere to be miscible with the polar water molecule in the plasma, while the center of the sphere contains the nonpolar fatty components of the phospholipids and cholesterol, storing the nonpolar triglycerides and cholesterol esters for transport and cellular delivery around the body through the bloodstream. Similarly, the lipid nanoparticle has a phospholipid membrane that contains and protects the delicate mRNA encoding for the spike protein to the cells of the body. Once the particle enters the cytoplasm of the host cell, the mRNA is delivered to the host ribosome where it is translated into the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Remember, there are no provisions to replicate messenger RNA in human cells as the molecule is produced through RNA polymerase from a DNA template in the nucleus. As such, protein production is limited by the volume of subgenomic material contained within the vaccine volume. Once formed, the spike proteins are then released from the cell and become available to train the immune system to produce antibodies against the spike. Remember, since the genetic sequence solely encodes for the spike protein, only spike B cells, plasma cells, and antibodies will be produced with the current mRNA vaccine. Memory B cells are created and subsequent infections with the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus activate the memory B cells, quickly ramping up antibody production to the spike protein of the actual virus. The antibody binding to the spike protein may physically block the virus from entering the host cell through the ACE2 surface protein or could mark the virus for destruction by other members of the lymphocyte community. As we wrap this up, a few things to consider. The mRNA and lipid nanoparticle transport molecules are quite delicate, requiring transport and storage at ultra-low temperatures of about minus 70 to minus 80 degrees Celsius, likely increasing the cost of production and delivery. The reported efficacy for these types of vaccines has been upwards of 95%. That is a statistical analysis based on the number of test individuals in the vaccinated group that developed COVID versus those in the placebo group that developed the same disease. Effectiveness, on the other hand, describes the ability to prevent disease in the most susceptible members of the general population. With the vaccine only providing immunity to one-fourth of the potential antigen targets of the virus, the fact that many patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection are completely asymptomatic and the still poorly understood mechanism of virulence in the sickest of patients provides a lot of uncertainties. As more countries approve the vaccine for use, the next few months should help us determine the actual effectiveness in the general population. Finally, keep in mind that smallpox is the only virus that mankind has completely eradicated from the population, and it took a very long time. Smallpox killed 30% of its victims and permanently scarred many survivors, making it clinically quite evident when someone was infected. On the other hand, the vast majority of patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection are either mildly symptomatic or completely asymptomatic, making it difficult or impossible to reliably track disease in the general population. As such, no matter what happens with the new vaccines, SARS-CoV-2 will be with us for a very long time, possibly forever. The sooner we accept that fact, the sooner we can get back to some semblance of normalcy. Stay safe, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.